Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Bradley United Methodist Church. I'm Reverend Steve McPeak. I'm the pastor here, and if you are worshiping with us for the first time, I'd like to say welcome and glad to have you with us today. We're so excited about uh, what's happening today. Today is uh, Pentecost Sunday, and I see some of you have worn your, your red for Pentecost. Awesome. That's nice. I, I enjoy seeing that out there. Um, also, uh, if you're watching online, I'd like to say welcome and glad to have you with us today as well. We're so glad that you chose to worship with Bradley United Methodist Church. And uh, just feel free to worship at home uh, along with the congregation, sing the hymns, whatever. Uh, pray the prayers. Uh, just uh, uh, participate, however, at home. Also, um, if you want to know what the announcements are, you can, they're on the back of the uh, bulletin. Uh, so we put all of the information, all the announcements are on the back of the bulletin. Uh, so you know what's going on in the church. If you would like to receive more information, we do have an email that goes out. Uh, and you can contact the church office and we will get you on that email list. And that will keep you informed as well. We send out a Friday blast that has information on it. Um, also on Facebook, if you sign up for Facebook, we have a, a Monday morning meditation minute that you can do as well. Uh, so if you would like to um, receive those, just uh, let us know and we will help you uh, get connected in that way. Also, um, if you would like to sign up for the Strawberry Festival, um, the timeout. <laughs> time out. I have a four signing. We're signed up. What? Yeah, We're full. We're full. Okay, so there's no room for anybody else to help. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to help, show up, and we'll find something for you to do. Good, good. So there's no pre-registration. You don't have to pre-sign up. Just show up. And um, okay, I'll, I'll I'll sign up for that. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll start that off. Um, yes, sign me up for the strawberry shortcake and the ice cream. So uh, great. So we're so glad that you're here today. And just let us prepare to worship the Lord our God this morning. Today we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit being poured out on the disciples and others in the upper room. Jesus is faithful and delivers that which he had promised from his heavenly Father. The Spirit gave them each the ability to speak about God's deeds of power. The church is created from a diverse group of people who are seeking an experience with the risen Jesus Christ. God is doing something new through his Son. By the power of the Holy Spirit, God makes all things new, including us. Pentecost is the promise that as people who have been transformed ourselves, we can assist in the transformation of the world into the kingdom of God.
life throws at us, we are reminded in how small, weak, and helpless we are on our own. But glory to God, we are not alone. During creation, your spirit swept across the depths of the ocean, molding the chaos into your creation. During Pentecost, your spirit again swept across those gathered there and molded them out of their chaos and despair into the body of Christ. Today, sweep again across the depths of our needs and remold us into new creatures. People filled with your glory and power. Remake us again into the church you have called us to be. Amen. come forward, I just want to remind you to please sign in the, um, the few pads. If you haven't signed in yet, uh, please sign in and uh, put your information in there and pass those down. Also online, there's a place in the comments section that you can click on that you also can uh, sign in and let us know how many people are watching with you. We'd greatly appreciate that. Well, good morning, kids. How are you doing? Good day. Good to see you this morning. You guys doing well? Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to ask you guys a question. I'm going to, what can this flame do? Burn stuff. 
burn stuff, <laughs> light candles, start fires, start fires. Yeah, and, and if you hold your hand over the top of it, does it create heat? Yeah. Warmth, keep, keep, keep you warm. Also hurts. Yeah. Uh, and now what can it do? It can um, <coughs> like nothing. Nothing, that's right. Good job, Susan. It can fire flowers. Yeah, yeah. Well, Suzanne's got it right. It's, you can do nothing without the flame. And so... Um, in our, our today is Pentecost and in our scripture today we read about the Holy Spirit and on the day of Pentecost divided tongues as a fire appeared, I, I'm talking can I, can I share my story? <laughs> is that okay? okay we're talking about the Holy Spirit in flames and so what happens is divided tongues as a fire appeared among the followers of Jesus. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's a good thing. And so what is the name of the fuel that kept these tongues of fire burning? I just said it. What is it that keeps these tongues of fire burning? Anybody want to say it? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that keeps this fire burning. And so that's the fuel. It was the Holy Spirit of God. And so these tongues of fire could give light to a dark world and warmth to people who need God's love. And so did the followers of Jesus let themselves run out of Holy Spirit fuel? Writer, come right back around here. <laughs> I can see you back up there on the screen that you're back there hiding. Out. And now Lucille's hiding too. So, are, are we going to, are we paying attention to me? I don't think so. I think they're all watching the screen up there. We may have to turn that off. Yeah. Because you're not paying attention, Ryder. <laughs> and so I'm trying to share, share a lesson with you today about the Holy Spirit. Okay? And so the followers of Jesus did not. They were open and opened themselves to God's Spirit and then went out into the world with the light of God's truth and the warmth of God's love. And so these followers of Jesus even helped other people to catch fire and become Christians. They shared that, that Holy Spirit with others as they witnessed about Jesus Christ and who he is and um, his resurrection, his life, and that he's Lord and Savior of the world. Yeah. And so we can offer light and warmth in the same way if we keep drawing on the fuel of the Holy Spirit of God. Do you guys want that fuel? Yes. Yeah. And so when we have faith in, in Jesus, when we um, ask Jesus into our heart and say, Lord, I want to be your child. I want to serve you. Forgive me. And um, then we're baptized. We, we receive the Holy Spirit as well. And so that's our fuel to live as Christians in the world, to go out and, and share the love of Christ and the warmth with others the warmth of his love. Okay? All right, let's pray. Let's pray together. Lord, we just thank you for your Holy Spirit that helps us and fuels us to do the mission that you've called us to do. For we are your children. You've called us to do the mission of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we just thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that you poured out on us. Amen. Amen. Okay, now you can go, go play. Please stand for the reading of the New Testament lesson. I will be reading from the book of Acts, chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. 
When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and Prolocytes. Cretans and Arabs in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and even your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they, will, they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. for organizing and wrapping these event, gifts for the event. 
We are celebrating with one high school graduate today. He is unable to be with us, but let me tell you about William Dixon. He is the son of Charlie and Leslie Dixon, and he is graduating from Greenfield Central High School and will be taking a gap year to prepare to attend college in Europe next year. As I introduce our college graduates, I would ask that you come forward to the front of the podium and remain here until all of our graduates have been introduced. And if you'll hold your applause, we will recognize them all at the end. Amanda Ellery recently graduated from Butler University with a Master of Music Composition degree. Amanda will continue her music endeavors as a featured composer with Sound Ecologies in Indianapolis this year as well as a solo performer specializing in 20th and 21st century contemporary flute music. Elise Huffman is the daughter of Bill and Kathleen Huffman. She graduated from Butler University with a degree in biology. And he, Elise accepted a position as a project manager with Epic Systems Corporation in Madison, Wisconsin and she's unable to join us because she has already moved to Wisconsin to begin her work. Devin Shaw graduated from Indiana University Jacobs School of Music with a master's in collaborative piano, and he will continue his postgraduate work this fall at Indiana University Jacobs School of Music. Avery Spencer is the daughter of David Spencer and Kathy Lee, and the granddaughter of Thelma Tink Spencer. She recently graduated from Purdue University with a double major in journalism or tourism and hospitality management and public relations. And Avery has accepted a position at Purdue Sports Properties. At this time, Reverend Peak is gonna offer a blessing over our graduates. I think it's important that we pray for them as they move on into the next chapter of life uh, with the support of the congregation, don't you? So let us pray together for them. Eternal and gracious God, we just thank you for these young adults that are here that have, Lord, uh, continued on in their education and have completed so. And so, Lord, we just pray your blessing upon them as they move into the next chapter of life. Lord, you would continue to lead them and guide them and use the gifts and the talents that you have provided to them for the glory of your kingdom. And we just ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
So we want to thank Delaney for her unwavering dedication, her boundless energy, her incredible wisdom, and we want to wish you all the best as you set off on an exciting new journey, knowing that you will forever hold a special place in the hearts of the Bradley United Methodist Church community. May your future be filled with even greater successes and endless joy. Best of luck on your new adventure. We will miss you dearly, but we know that you will continue to shine where the light takes you. So thank you. Delaney, it's an honor to present you with this Certificate of Achievement. Uh, and this acknowledges that uh, Delaney Morlock has been recognized for eight years of outstanding service as Director of Preschool of the Bradley United Methodist Church in Greenfield, Indiana. And so thank you so much for your service and all of you that have been Lord. That was the 
name of that song? Oh, somebody got caught on the. <laughs> yeah. So this morning, I also say, Great is our Lord. Amen. Great is our Lord. And today we celebrate Pentecost, which is the Sunday that they, the time in which we say the church was born. It was the time that the breath of life was breathed into the church. And it became the church. And so in the New Testament Greek, the word for ecclesia, the word is usually translated church. It also means assembly or congregation or meeting. It does not refer to a building. The Greek literally means called out ones. So as we are the church, we are the called out ones to be separate from the world, but yet in the world. To go out into the world and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. To continue the ministry of Jesus Christ in the world for the glory of God's kingdom. And so some scholars have stressed that this called out sense of the word provides a hint as to how we should understand the church. An assembly of those who have been called out or separated for a special purpose or called out from the world to live godly lives. We are to be the light in a dark world. We are to help people see God in a world. A God of love. In a world of hate. And it can be difficult, even in today's world, to do that. But I begin to see that the United Methodist Church is, is trying to do that better. Since they have made some changes in this last general conference. And at the end of the service, we're going to have a video to show, to help you understand what happened. It's a wrap up of the, the general conference. But we are called to, 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 to go out. We, uh, the new day for these persons gathered who are called out to wait and pray begins with an eruption of sounds from heaven and of wind. Things are coming loose, breaking open. The wind is blowing new life upon these disciples, these apostles. And can it be the same wind which on the very first morning of all morning swept across the waters, the deep, as God created on the first day? I believe this is the same spirit that hovered over the waters as, as God spoke, let there be light, let there be water, let there be land. That that's the same wind, the same breath of God that happened on this Pentecost Sunday. But how might we spell church? The church, the body of Christ. How might we spell that? So I, there's a, 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 an acrostic that I, I kind of put together. And it's C... For Caris, Caris, Grace, H for healing, U for united, R for repentance restored and renewed. I couldn't really settle on one of those. And uh, C is for compassion, and then H is for hope. So let's briefly look at each of these words for church. Caris is 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 the the Greek word. And it appears more than 100 times in the New Testament. And it's usually translated grace. And it emphasizes goodwill and kindness and favor. And not only is this a gift 
extended to us by God, but it is a quality that the church offers to the world. It is the mark of a Christian. Charis refers to that which offers joy and pleasure, delight and sweetness, charm, loveliness, and the grace of speech that is seasoned and moderate, thus provoking harmonious fellowship amongst the congregation. H is for healing. After Peter preached his first sermon, which is recorded after this scripture that we just read this morning, Jesus was long gone, and, and, and so here he performs his first act of healing. When a beggar approached him asking for cash, Peter says, um, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And the man stood up and walked. He was healed from his affliction. And this is the first recorded miracle that was done by the church after the ascension of Jesus. And so the church has always been known as a movement Concern not only with spiritual healing, but with healing of the body. And so no wonder so many hospitals around the world were established by the institutional church to alleviate suffering and pain. And this is one of the things that the founder of the United Methodist Church thought was important. John Wesley would establish hospitals, orphanages, Homes for the disabled. He would take care of people who were broken and hurting. And that's one thing I love about the United Methodist Church. Is we have established hospitals to care for people. Children's homes to help children. Because that's part of who we are. The third word, the you in church is united. And this is a prickly one, right? You know, here's what Jesus had to say about it. I ask that they may all be one, that they may be one as we are one, completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me. Then the Apostle Paul claimed, chimed in, and he says, Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you should be in agreement and that there should be no divisions among you, but that you should be united in the same mind and same purpose. Well, that's not going to happen, is it? We can't agree on what color the carpet's supposed to be sometimes. And it's difficult. You get two people together, they're always going to have a differing opinion. It might have been possible in those early days of the ancient church, but not now. There's too many opinions. And how can we possibly create unity about the various values, theologies, rituals, ideals, and causes, institutional agendas, and ideological isms that we champion or protest and argue on social media? difficult. No, the unity of the church is not about that. Put 100 Christians in a room and ask them to agree on something. And uh, as they say in Texas, you might as well try to put stocks on a rooster. You know, ain't gonna happen. But there's unity that is possible. It focuses not on agendas, on rituals, on causes or institutions. It is a unity we as Christians have about attitudes and behavior. When push comes to shove, we have faith. We cling to hope and we love one another. Look at 1 Corinthians 13. In fact, this chapter of 13 verses details the kind of unity that is possible for the church. It reminds us that we can disagree but we cannot be disagreeable, right? That we can be gifted and talented, but still absent of love. Hmm. 
And we can put a hundred Christians in a room together and they may not agree on whether to use debts, trespasses, or sins in the Lord's Prayer. But they will definitely treat one another with respect, kindness, gentleness, patience, and love. The sort of unity is possible. And our preference, our preferences, things that we like, that we want, that make us feel comfortable, these usually divide. They divide us. But Jesus Christ's teaching, restore, and his mission unites us as one body. When we focus on Jesus and what Jesus is calling us to do, what we have been called out to do, unites us in one faith. The R in church is, like I said, I, I, I couldn't decide on one or the other, so it's repent, restore, and renew. And Peter tells the crowd in verse 21, then everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter preached the first sermon to unbelievers of the Lord, of, of, of the community that would have gathered around who heard this wind, who heard this noise and heard these people speaking in their own language. And he told them this, is, this was a fulfillment of the prophet Joel. He connected this experience to the story of Jesus, his life, his death and resurrection as proof that Jesus is the Messiah. Peter and the others are witnesses of Jesus' resurrection. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, a circumcision of the heart. And Peter said, and, the, and, the other, and, and said to the Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts records about 3,000 people were added to the church that day. What a, what, what a, a powerful message Peter preached. And then C, the second C in church, is compassionate. The church reflects the compassion of Jesus Christ. They feed the hungry. They contributed to the needs of others. They welcomed those who were outcasts of the synagogue and society. They serve others with compassion. Colossians 3, verses 12 through 17, describes how we are to be the church. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive them. Forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, Clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. One body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and with gratitude in your hearts. Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything, everything, everything in this name of our Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God. The Father through Him. Everything we do is supposed to be in the name of Jesus Christ. To glorify God in everything we do. And as the called out ones, the church can expect to suffer for our compassion, our grace, and our love. It's 
It's, it's not something that the world can understand. They don't understand why we forgive one another. They don't understand how we can be compassionate and forgiving and loving to those who are our enemies, who harm us. But we do, because that's what Jesus taught us to do. And as the called out ones, we will suffer. Listen to what the author of Hebrews says to the early church. For you had compassion for those who were in prison, and you cheerfully accepted the plundering of your possessions, knowing that you yourselves possess something better and more lasting. Amen? Can you imagine being a, a member of this church and having your house plundered, your possessions confiscated, taken away because of your faith in Jesus Christ? That's what happened. But yet they continued to serve Christ. They continued to gather and assemble together to sing songs of praise, to pray for one another, to fellowship with one another. And the last letter in the word church stands for hope. But the church has also been characterized by hope, as we know. There's not just suffering, there's also hope. And the hope of the church is grounded in the faithfulness of God. Therefore, as Paul notes, we have hope. Character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. What a gift. What a gift that Jesus gave to his church. The Holy Spirit that gives us hope that's been poured into our hearts. We have hope, church. Even in the midst of all that's happening around us in this world today, with all the chaos, with all the, the, the harm that's happening, with all the death and destruction taking place in our world today, there is still hope. Hope does not disappoint us. This New Testament church existed rather simply. It existed visibly as the gathered church when it was assembled together. And it, exists, it existed invisibly as they were scattered. As the scattered church when it left the assembly and went into the world. When believers gathered, four things happened according to the verses in 42 through 47. Some th someone attending church in those days would uh, not go to a purpose-built structure like we have today, this beautiful church building. They would more likely meet in homes where they would gather together. Or they would meet in the catacombs. That's where they buried people. That's where they were down with the dead people, the bones of their beloved family members. But they gathered together to worship, and once they, they were there, one could expect the following. To hear some teaching, to experience fellowship, which no doubt included occasional potluck dinners. You know, with the, the, the occasional, um, what do they call that, uh, green bean casserole? With the Campbell's mushroom can of soup, you got to put that in there. There was breaking of bread, and this may or may not have been communion. It may have just been where they ate together, had a meal together, and praying. There was always prayer. Praying for each other. Praying for God to break, God to break through in a powerful way. But prayer... And the Apostle Paul also mentions singing and encouraging, encourages the practice. He says, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts. 
And Paul knew about this singing because when he was in prison, he and the other apostles would begin to sing. And the guards are like, what are you doing? And they would sing, praise the God, even in the midst of their suffering. And you know how that can change someone's attitude, someone's heart, someone's countenance? Have you ever tried singing songs that glorify God in the midst of your suffering and how that seems to subside the suffering? Try it sometimes. It, it works. It's a blessing. So Paul says to sing. And finally, perhaps the best way to answer the question of how to spell church is to say that today there are many ways to spell church. And it is the genius of the church that it is empowered to reach all the people of the world, of every tribe, of every nation. So that as on the day of Pentecost, everyone should hear the voice of God in their own language. And the church, as it, the expression of God on earth, has a voice that ought to catch the ear of all people across all cultures and ethnicities, all social boundaries. We are to take that word of God everywhere. <clears throat> to all places and all people. There should be no soul on Pentecost who cannot feel the power of God and know that the Holy Spirit can descend on them. There's no soul on earth that should not know that God loves them and that they are beloved of God, created in God's image. This is our mission. There is no soul that should not know that the Holy Spirit can descend upon them like tongues of fire and a mighty wind. None. Because that is the purpose of the church. We are the called, the gathered, and the sent. And we come and we have the Holy Spirit that comes upon us to give us the power to go out from these walls and to witness to our faith. To be light in the darkness. And to share the warmth of love with others. For this is a place for all people. Amen. Everyone is welcome here. Everyone. Let's go out and invite people to experience the love of God, His forgiveness, His spirit, His healing, His redemption, His peace, and His joy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We'll go to the Lord in prayer this morning and on the back of your sheet you, you'll see a list of names of people that are asking for prayer or we are asking for prayer for we're just so glad that Bob is here today we're thankful for that he had a, a health scare a couple days ago and uh, Kathy met that also was in a car accident with Dave so we want to keep them in our prayers as she continues to recover from that. So let us go to the Lord in prayer. Eternal and gracious God, we just give you thanks and praise for allowing us to wake up this morning and see another sunrise. Lord, we're so thankful for the many blessings that you've given to us because we know that today some did not wake up. Some are no longer with us today. And so, Lord, we pray that you would be with those families, those people who have lost a loved one. We pray, Lord, that you would comfort them and minister to them in this difficult time of grief and sorrow. Lord, we pray for those that have not just lost a loved one, 
but are also grieving the loss of a home, a business, a relationship. For Lord, we know that many are impacted by the storms, the tornadoes, the floods that happen in the spring every year. And so, Lord, our hearts go out to them right now and ask you, Lord, to comfort them as they grieve their losses. Lord, we also pray for those that are in the hospitals, in the beds right now, recovering from a a, a procedure, a surgery, an accident, an illness. Those that are at home, unable to get out of their beds. Those that are in the long-term care facilities, oh God, we pray that you would touch them and minister to them and heal them right now. For Lord, we know that you are the great physician and that you can do this. And that all things are possible for you. And Lord, we also pray that you would also take away hatred from the hearts of men and women who would want to see others dead and harmed. We pray, Lord, that you would change swords into plowshares and that there would be war no more. Where innocent men, women, and children are dying daily from the many bombs and guns. Lord, we pray that your peace will come. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to use us as your church, as those sent into the world who have been called out to be your ministers in the world. Continue to pour out your spirit upon us and use us in a mighty way, O God, that we might be able to transform the world. That would more reflect your kingdom. And now let us pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory forever. Amen. If the ushers will prepare to come forward at this time, we'll continue to worship through the giving of God's tithe and our offering. Um, those of you who are watching online, if you would like to participate in this part of the worship service, you're invited to do so. There in the, uh, in the comments section, uh, you can click on a link that will take you to the giving page of our website. And you can also uh, contribute to the ministries of Bradley United Methodist Church there. And if you have and and are doing so, we just want to say thank you. We're so appreciative of your uh, generosity in in helping make the ministries here at Bradley uh, happen. And so thank you as well as you continue to faithfully uh, give your tithe and your offering. You help make the ministries happen here at Bradley United Methodist Church. Help us to reach out into the community and hopefully change lives for the kingdom of God. So if the ushers will come forward at this time.
creating and giving God. On this Pentecost Sunday, we claim the blessing of your Holy Spirit at work in us as individuals and as a faith community brought together in the name of your Son, our Savior, Christ. We thank you that by the Spirit we are being made one in heart and mind and love. Because your Spirit is working within us, we want to share what we have to help others. In bringing this offering, we express our willing participation in Christ's ministry. Accept us with our gifts for his sake. Amen. After me. <laughs> Beloveds of Bradley. Beloveds of Bradley. You are the church. You are the church. Go out as witnesses. Go out as witnesses. Of God's power, grace, and love. Of God's power, grace, and love. Amen.
Amen. Beginning April 23rd, 2024, delegates from across our worldwide connection came together for the United Methodist Church's General Conference in Charlotte, North Carolina. Let's see what happened. When we came into General Conference, uh, there were many who were concerned about the three R's regionalization, revised social principles, and removing restrictive language. It is moved to adopt calendar item number 22, worldwide regionalization. Calendar item number 22 has been approved. It's a very uh, good step towards a collaboration as one people, as wise as one family. We used to be a U.S. church with satellites in different parts of the world now will become a truly global church where we relate to each other on a more equal level. So today, May 1st, 2024, there has been lots of communication, communications that have been circulated across the worldwide church related to, quote unquote, the ban against those that identify as LGBTQIA. If you have been in any listening session across the annual conference, you have heard about this matter related to human sexuality, where that in, within the Book of Discipline, in various parts, from the social principles to the Book of Discipline related to ordained ministry, there are and has been prohibited language related to those that identify as LGBTQIA. And coming into this general conference, there have been legislative committees, there have been lots of conversations, and today, the legislation duly before the body passed affirmatively for which there will not be restrictive language related to those that identify as LGBTQIA. We have a fantastic delegation, just an amazing team of people who are faithful and committed. Delegates without debate passed an end to a 40-year-old ban on self-avowed practicing homosexuals from being clergy. We passed the removal of this ban on gay clergy with an overwhelming 93% affirmative vote, a signal of a new period of unity in our church. One thing that I've been encouraged by in this general conference specifically is the feeling that we are moving forward and that we are not dwelling. The United Methodist Church has not ended, it will not end, and it will continue. That feeling is evident in the hallways, in the legislative committee rooms, on the floor of the plenary session. The United Methodist Church will continue and will be better because of the historic work we've done at this general conference. Uh, we are getting closer to coming home and sharing the good news of the work that, that this body, this legislation has come through and done. Uh, the budget has passed. We have a guide for our next four years, our next quadrennium. And that guide includes a more productive, more intentional, missional order of the work of the United Methodist Church. We also just passed the smallest budget in the history of the General Conference. The U.S. jurisdictions have agreed to no elections for the time being, and a total of 32 U.S. bishops allocated across the jurisdictions, and deacons finally have 
sacramental authority in ministry contexts. Calendar item number 554 is adopted. This is an historic note. I have a confession to make, Indiana. I said the general conference is often overrated. I was wrong. A lot of good things have happened at this general conference, but I want you to know that in Indiana and across the United Methodist Church, there is a place for everyone. If you are a traditionalist, if you're a progressive, if you're just a plain old United Methodist who loves God and wants to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, this is our time. This is our season. Be encouraged. We just want to keep you informed as to what's going on so that you will know. And um, just continue to keep praying for the church and uh, as we move forward into what God is doing. And so now, go forth from this place in the power of the Holy Spirit to love and serve the Lord. Amen.